Each week at Grace Bible Church, we take time to remember Jesus, who gave himself in love for us. We take time to remember Jesus through communion, the Lord's Supper. So today we're going to be guided in our remembrance by the book of Ephesians. Ephesians starting in chapter 5, verse 1. So open your Bible to Ephesians 5, 1. And if you don't have a Bible, uh, we have men who are going to, who have Bibles in their hands. They can give them to you. If you don't have one, just raise your hand and they'll give one to you. It's such a blessing to have your own copy of God's word open on your lap while we remember Jesus together. So please, if you don't have a Bible, take one and read along with me. So again, we're going to be in Ephesians 5, verse 1. So Ephesians 5, starting in verse 1, says, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. This verse starts with the most impossible commands the Bible could give. Be imitators of God. Don't just skim over that as if, okay, that's, you know, that's just one command that, you know, one more thing to do in the Christian life. This is, this actually is the highest command that could ever be uttered. The most impossible command to do. And it's, only possible for God's children. And it's the only appropriate behavior for God's children, which is why he doesn't just say, Paul doesn't just say, be imitators of God. Be imitators of God as beloved children. This harkens back to the very beginning of the book. Ephesians 1, 4 through 5. You don't have to turn there. I'll read it. It says, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to the kind intention of his will. Note which is first. Is obedience first or is sonship first? Christian, we are commanded and empowered to be obedient because we are his his children. He arranged that adoption before we existed, much less before we could do anything good or impressive. In fact, much the opposite, right? We did only sin. We were dead in our trespasses and sin, and yet God made us alive together with him. So preach to your heart right now. If you're tempted maybe to to come to communion with a a thought of, man, I had a bad week. I don't feel like my relationship with God is right. Sin does hamper a relationship, right? But it does not destroy sonship for those who are his children. Your obedience doesn't earn adoption. It's evidence of it. And you may be, you may know that theologically. But if you bring like guilt to this time that that might make you feel like, man, I'm just not worthy of taking this bread and juice, tempted to pass it on. If you're a believer, banish that thought because you don't come to this table worthy because of your obedience, because of your obedience to this God mimicking command. This week, you don't come and and take this bread and juice because you followed that command perfectly. But rather, you're empowered to do that because of your adoption as sons. And we're going to see in this passage that obedience to this command comes not as you focus on yourself and your own behavior, but as you get your eyes off yourself and on to Christ, who we remember at this meal. 
children tend to act like their parents. And if you have faith in Jesus, you are a true child of God with a new nature saved to imitate God. God is kind towards you. Be kind. Look back at verse 32. God is kind towards you. Be kind. God is tender-hearted towards you. Be tender-hearted towards one another. And God has forgiven you, Christian. Forgive one another. Just as God in Christ has forgiven you. So, as we remember Jesus, evaluate your interactions with others this week. Don't just look at where you did well. If you do see evidence of godliness in your relationships, don't pass over that. Praise God for it because it is evidence of your adoption as sons and daughters. But do you see any evidence in your heart of look up at 31 of chapter 4? Bitterness, wrath, Anger, clamor, slander, or malice. You need to remind yourself that no matter what that person did to earn your bitterness or your anger against them, there is no possible way that they've sinned against you more than you sinned against your Lord. And still, in love, he has completely forgiven you. So act like sons, daughters. Be imitators of God and extend that forgiveness, that tenderheartedness, that kindness to each other. That's a mark of the church. That's a mark of Christians because Christ also, God in Christ also forgave you. And the next command after verse 1 is, if you look up at chapter 5, verse 2, Walk in love. That's really a, a summary command of, of really the, the chapter that had come before. And it's the summary, I think, of what it means to imitate God. These commands at the end of chapter 4, this godlike imitation, it's summed up in that command of 5.2, to walk in love. But we see the same words in 5.2 as we saw in 4.32. Walk in love just as Christ also loved you. And what did he do in that love for you? He gave himself up for us. An offering and a sacrifice to God is a fragrant aroma. In a couple minutes, Christian, you're going to have a piece of bread and a cup of juice in your hand. Don't just take that thoughtlessly or feel rushed because of the prayer that's coming afterwards. I, I want you to, to look at that, those physical reminders in your hand. And let them be tangible, physical reminders of Jesus. And let that tangible, physical reminder of Jesus remind you of God's love for you. For you individually. You personally. Christ loved you. Yes, he loved all of us. This is a plural you, but the fact that it is an expression of love for all who would believe doesn't diminish the fact that it was an expression of love personally for all who are predestined to adoption as sons. Each blow on his back, each thorn in his skull, as he cried out in agony to the Father to hear only silence, all of that was an expression of love for me, for you. Remember that when you look at the bread that reminds you of his body given up for you and his blood spilt. It's a sacrifice acceptable, even pleasing to the Father. God in Christ gave himself up as an expression of that love. How did he do that? You see it, second half of verse 2, as an offering, a sacrifice to God. Remember, Jesus didn't love you and me because we were godly, quite the opposite. He loved us while we were dead in our sins. And our sins would keep us from God. Actually, each one of them, each one of your many sins, each one of my multitude of sins, 
earns an eternity under God's wrath. The stench of those sins in God's nostrils. The ones before you were saved and the ones since and the ones you will continue to commit until the day that you're died and you're made like him when he returns, right? That day will come, 1 John 3, 2. We'll be made like him because we'll see him as he is. But until that day and there's sin, each, that's the stench of that sin in God's nostrils has been removed. Because Jesus Christ, for all who would believe, offered himself up as, a fra- as an offering and a sacrifice. It's a fragrant aroma to God. This is not just the good smell like in the Old Testament, the sacrifices of bulls and goats roasting. Right, barbecue smells good. This is so much better. This is the sacrifice of God the Son giving himself up to hang on the cross in humiliation, pain, and death, bearing on himself in his body that we're going to remember with the bread in the just penalty for our sins. This is love. And how could we not now as beloved children love one another? Forgive one another from the heart. Even, I wish we could go on, set aside sin. We were saved to Christ's likeness. There there must not be sin named among us. That can't be who we are in light of what God has done for us. So as you remember, repent of sins. Pursue holiness. Worship the Lord. And the only way, we must remember that the only way to receive God's self-giving, forgiving love is faith. What that means is, Christian, banish any thought that you earned this. Despair of any thought that you're worthy. And cling to him in faith. But for you who haven't yet believed, what that means, if you're here this morning and you are not a Christian, by your own profession, your only hope to be right with God isn't faith in him alone. Maybe you don't care about being right with God, or maybe you're clinging to to religion, coming every day to church, or, or just looking to make yourself better. If that's what you're here for today, this time isn't for you. You haven't been adopted as, as God's son. So let the bread and juice pass. We're glad that you're here. But this isn't for you. But it could be. It could be. Apart from Jesus taking your sins on himself, you will stand before God, not as son, not with him as your father, but with him as your judge. Seeing not Christ's holiness, his righteousness on top of you, but God, the perfect holy judge, seeing only your sins on you, and you will be banished from his presence to hell forever. And that is not an overreaction to your sin. But every one of those sins could be placed on Jesus, removed from you as far as the east is from the west. And you will receive adoption as sons, God's forgiveness, if you would only turn to him in repentance and faith. If you want that, or if you want to know more, don't leave here today without talking to me or one of the elders, or really anybody you see taking the bread and juice, we would love to tell you of this very, very good news. So men, come forward. Please serve us. And Christians, as as your heart is prepared, please take communion on your own.